Hello, this is Catherine from Accelerated Reader, reading books for you. Today, I will be reading the epilogue from The Moon and the Magic Box by Michael Ross, illustrated by Magdalena Attic. Before I begin reading, I would like to give a big thanks to the author for sending me this book to read on my channel. In the description below, I've included links where me find and purchase this book. Don't forget to like, and subscribe. Epilogue. Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt stepped into the spacecraft. It was very like the experience of stepping into the magic box they had done a week earlier. It was huge inside the spaceship. It seemed to go on into the distance for as far as the eye could see. There were lots of little pangies who had turned and waved to them. Pangi led the way to the bridge of the spacecraft. All the walls were a shiny silver, as was the floor and the curved ceiling, which was so tall, again, they couldn't see how tall it was. They went up several steps, and in front of them, there was a grand armchair, again, which was all silver. In front of that, a long, Horizontal observation window. Pangi invited Troy to sit in the pilot's chair and relax, which he did. Troy felt Desmi's hand on his shoulder, so he turned and smiled at her and said, Oh boy, this is probably the most exciting thing I have ever done. Just then, another posh English voice came to them from just behind the pilot's seat. It was Nesbitt, again, just as happened when they all went into the magic box. Nesbitt was able to speak English. Nesbitt came out with, Yep, Troy, master, you look so cool. It was at that point that Troy and Desmi looked around. It took them both by surprise and Nesbitt could see it on their faces, so he said, What, never seen a talking dog before? As soon as Nesbitt said that, he started laughing. More a panting type of laugh, but a laugh nonetheless. Pangi, Troy, and Desmi thought this was also very funny. Pangi mentioned to them all that some of the changes that they experienced in the magic box would also be replicated on board the spacecraft. Pangi also told them that when they eventually were back on Earth, everything would revert to how it was before. Troy started to relax some more. Three or four little alien scientists came forward and placed a contraption over Troy's head. It was a collection of different colored wires and lots of little bulbs similar to those you would find wrapped around a Christmas tree. Troy was pleasantly surprised. The contraption was very comfortable to wear. At this point, Pangi stepped forward and told Troy what was about to happen. He said to Troy that the map extraction unit would be switched on and it would very gently start to extract all the secret star maps from his head to enable them to find their way to Palitilimalimi, Pangi's home planet. Then, from this space armchair, there extended two silver curved arms. At the end of each one was a smooth pink crystal. Troy was invited to extend his arms and place his hands on each of the pink crystals, which he did. They all heard a gentle humming, but it wasn't engines of any sort. All the thousands of little aliens were stood still, and the humming was coming from them? Pengi explained that the spacecraft is biological. In other words, it is a living conscious entity and what makes it move, what supplies the energy, is beautiful harmonic voices. 
every single alien was humming in tune, and the notes were very hypnotic. Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt could feel the spacecraft starting to shudder gently, and it hovered just off the ground. Then, everything started to happen at once. The map extraction unit was switched on. It lit up with little colored lights flashing all over the place. The pink crystals Troy's hand was placed on started to glow and throb. Pengi said that the maps in Troy's head were being transferred to the spacecraft's onboard navigation equipment. But Troy still had to pilot the craft. His right hand could move the spacecraft up, down, left, right, forward, and backward, while his left hand controlled the speed. He did this by simply squeezing the crystal or moving his hand around on top of it. Pangy was right at his side, guiding him. For a few moments, Troy was a little apprehensive. Pangy could sense this and said, Relax, Troy, boy, and squeeze der right hand, V go up, and squeeze der left hand, and V go fast, yeah? Okay, said Troy, and did what he was told to do. Well, Pangy forgot to mention that the controls are very sensitive, so only needed squeezing very gently. Troy squeezed the crystal with all his might, so the spacecraft shot upwards with such force. Everyone on board ended up sitting on the floor of the spacecraft. Troy realized what had happened and said, Oops. Pangy started to laugh, his squeaky laugh, and said, Oops. And my goodness, Troy boy, let's go gently, pretty please. It didn't take Troy long to get the hang of it. Well, not before he tried to descend. But again, pressed too hard and the spacecraft shot towards the ground, resulting in hundreds of little aliens floating in midair for a few seconds, including Desmi and Nesbitt. Troy shouted out at the top of his voice, Sorry, guys! But no one was the worse for fear. And then they were off. Pengi told him that the onboard computer would direct the craft to Pali Tilly Mali Me. Now it had the coordinates, and Troy just had to control the direction and speed. Two hours later, they could see a yellow, gaseous planet in front of them. This was Pali Tilly Mali Me. Pengi told Troy he could let go of the controls now and had the map extractor unit removed. The spacecraft was now on autopilot and would be able to land on its own, which it did in a very unusual looking city. Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt felt like celebrities. It seems everyone had come out to greet them, all of them thanking Troy for helping Pengi and helping save the moon. They met the grand ruler of Pali Tilly Mali Me, who had a very unusual name, which was Kingo Dingo Du. Only Kingo Dingo Du could have access to the fortress where all the Cordoyo crystals were held. But Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt were invited in with him as his special guests. The Grand Ruler selected three of the largest and brightest Cordoyo crystals, put them in a purple velvet lined wooden box, and presented them to Troy for safekeeping. They couldn't stay for long because the moon was on its last legs and looked very dark indeed. The Cordoyo crystals needed to be inserted into the middle of the moon urgently. So they said their goodbyes, boarded the spacecraft, and set off back to the moon. The spacecraft knew its way to the moon, so Troy could relax and enjoy the journey. A couple of hours later, the dark moon showed up in their observation window. 
They landed in the moon's largest crater called South Pole Aitken Basin, which is 2,000 kilometers long and 13 kilometers deep. Pengi explained that at the bottom of the crater is a secret entrance to the inside of the moon. So far, NASA on Earth had not noticed it. The spacecraft landed just to the side of the hidden entrance. Troy, Desmi, Nesbitt, and Pangi hopped onto the moon's surface. Because the gravity is less strong on the moon, they had to be careful not to jump. Otherwise, they would go shooting up into the air. Nobody had bothered to tell poor Nesbitt, who kept disappearing into the moon's atmosphere sometimes as high as 18 feet. For Nesbitt, it was mixed emotions. On one hand, Nesbitt was worried he might jump up so hard he would disappear into space. On the other hand, it was so much fun he didn't ever want it to end. They all then went into the depths of the moon. They went into what looked like a lift. The door slid closed. Then they shot downwards at an incredible speed for a minute or two. And then, as suddenly as it started to descend, it stopped. When the doors opened, they were in the inner workings of the moon. Two alien scientists took them to a large machine in the middle of the floor. The machine was dark and silent. It was matte black and very smooth, but on the front, behind some ornate glass covers, were three circular indentations. The scientists indicated to Troy to place the crudoidal crystals in the indentations. As soon as he did, the lighting that was surrounding them suddenly became a lot brighter. The machine in front of them started to glow a beautiful blue color and a sound began to emanate from it, which sounded like the voices of a thousand angels. It was quite lovely. Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt were transfixed. They stayed there and listened for a minute or two, taking that beautiful sound in. They all trooped back into the lift and it ascended back to the surface of the moon. When they got out, they couldn't believe just how bright the moon was now. Pengi gave them all special solar sunglasses, even Nesbitt. Troy and Desmi looked at Nesbitt wearing the glasses and burst out laughing. They both agreed that Nesbitt looked like the coolest dog in the universe. Sadly, it was time to go home. They boarded the spacecraft, which then landed and dropped them off next to the old oak tree close to Bramble Wood. As Pangy explained, they needed to be as secretive as possible to not raise any alarms from others in the area. Pangy told them he would always be on the moon, that they could always call on him if they needed help. Pengi stepped back on board the spacecraft and waved for the last time. They were all going to miss him, even Nesbitt, who was wagging his tail as if there was no tomorrow. Pengi told them that he would let Troy's mum know they were back and that she could expect them back at the farmhouse very soon. As they were all walking back to the farmhouse, they looked up into the night sky and remarked how beautiful the moon was. Now it was back to normal. They arrived at the farmhouse, but Desmi turned around for one final look and grabbed Troy's hand. And with her other, she pointed into the night sky and said, Look, Troy! A meteorite. Troy looked up and remarked with a big smile on his lips. Oh, yes. Well, 
It looks like one. But then again, you don't think it could be Pengi coming back in another fireball, do you? I need a few days to rest before we go on another adventure. They laughed out loud, hugged each other tightly, held hands, and walked through the door and into the farmhouse. Glynis was already there and said to them all, with mock anger, tapping her watch, and said, And what time do you call this? They laughed and hugged and went into the kitchen. Glynis had made Troy's favorite stew and homemade granary bread. The smell was heavenly. Of course, let's not forget Nesbitt. Glynis's stew was his favorite as well. The end. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. In the description below, I've included links where we find and purchase this book. Author's Notes Hello, thank you for reading this book. I genuinely hope you enjoyed it. For an author, feedback and reviews are very important, so please could I ask you to leave a review on Amazon? Even one sentence would help spread the news. Also, let me know if you would like to see more adventures with Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt. If I have enough response, I would undoubtedly write some more exciting adventures. You can always email me at thewandchronicles at gmail.com with anything to do with this book, what you liked and what you didn't like. Did you know I have written several other books? The Wand Chronicles series. This comprises four books, all about what happens when elves meet humans for the first time. The first book of the series is free and tells you all about what will happen in the ensuing series. You can go here for that free book called The Prequel. I have also written the following. Young Teen's collection of short, scary stories. And they are terrifying. Just five more minutes. A true life story and a very sad one at that. A collection of very young children's books, three to seven, the Arnie and Mia series. All these books may be found on Amazon. So thank you once again, take care and stay safe. And please do drop me an email. I love to make a connection with my readers wherever in the world you may be. Michael Ross. About the author. It was a clairvoyant that told Michael that he should write a book. The first, a comedy called Memoirs from the SBC. The second, a true life story called Just Five More Minutes, which won the 2019 Independent audiobook awards. But from when he could remember, he always had a strong interest in sci-fi and fantasy and had a voracious appetite for epic fantasy in particular. So the Wand Chronicles trilogy is an amalgamation of his creative ideas, thoughts, and experiences. He has also written children's books for five to seven-year-olds, the Arnie and Mia series, a book brim full of scary stories for 13 to 18-year-olds and beyond. And now, this magical adventure of a lifetime for young teens involving goodies, baddies, and a lot more in between. About the Illustrator Magdalena Attic is a very gifted illustrator artist and came on board to design the cover for Michael's true life story called Just Five More Minutes, which went on to win a design award and since then has been very much involved in his further projects. Her passion, artistry, 
and creativeness are second to none. Magdalena's work ethic is one of perfection and it shows in everything she creates. The end. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. In the description below, I've included links where you may find and purchase this book.